Uh, before we talk more about that and, and some of your books and uh, the OTO and so forth, I'd, I'd like to, if uh, you don't mind, Lon, if you could just share with us a little bit about um, how you first became interested in magic, uh, Alistair Crowley and the Kabbalah and, and even the, the Tarot. It's always interesting to hear how people uh, get involved in these uh, esoteric subjects. Well, I, I guess we could start by saying I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s, uh, a flower child, an aging hippie. Uh, I got interested in, um, in human consciousness. I, I guess we could uh, lump everything into that term. Uh, back in the mid-1960s, um, when I uh, came in contact and had uh, uh, several uh, remarkable and um, influential experiences uh, with uh, LSD and uh, psychedelics. And I, up until that time, uh, I was more or less a, uh, a Midwestern materialist. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I didn't have very much interest in, uh, in spiritual matters per se, as I was uh, growing up, but I always considered myself sort of a spiritual um, uh, explorer. Yes. And part of my exploration, as soon as I graduated from high school and came out to California to go to college, uh, was with uh, the, the psychedelic phenomena. And... Um, it uh, it more or less, I don't want to bore you with I saw God on LSD uh, story, <laughs> but uh, it, it 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 more or less told me that uh, uh, human consciousness uh, was a far more wonderful and uh, uh, the fact that learning about myself was going to be the the only. Uh, endeavor worth pursuing for the rest of my life, and that mm. uh, that that was a springboard uh, into Eastern mysticism, which uh, was you know popular with the Beatles and everything. And, right, right. Uh, and so I sort of um, uh, dove in to the deep end of the pool of Eastern mysticism, and sort of fancied uh, that I would gain enlightenment with a nice shaved head and sitting in a full lotus and, and, uh, uh, but it was sort of strange. I, uh, I imagined myself losing my ego and becoming completely enlightened, but I did it in such a way as, um, uh, I thought I would look really cool being in, <laughs> being in, I would look right. really cool losing my ego. Right. You know? right. Yeah, and so it was. Uh, I sooner or later came uh, face to face with the fact that that um, uh, in a very uh, real way, the 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 Eastern mystical method and the Western mystical or magical uh, method, uh, the goal is the same thing, but the but the process is is uh, completely different. So I came to the conclusion that I was trying to play. Uh, Eastern mysticism software on my Western hardware. Yes, you know, and and um, it it just wasn't working out, and so I I went on a kind of a frustrating quest for a few years to find something in uh, that resonated with my with my Western psyche, uh, the same way that. Uh, uh, the Eastern psyche uh, resonates with things like the Tao Te Ching and and um, uh, the, the you know the wonderful uh, uh, concepts of of Tao of the Tao. Yes. And uh, um, so I was I was looking for a Western Tao, and uh, for a while I wasn't coming up with very much. Uh, you know, Christian mysticism, um, uh, at least for me. Uh, contained uh, or brought with it uh, a lot of unfortunate baggage uh, of uh, you know self-loathing and, and <laughs> guilt and, and all of those nasty things. And um, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't have to be that way with everybody, but with my particular background, <clears throat> it did. Mm. So um, 
uh, it finally, uh, I finally started to get a clue when my, uh, my brother uh, joined uh, an organization called um, uh, Rosicrucian Order, A-M-O-R-C. Right. AMORC. And you've seen them advertised in Popular Mechanics <laughs> in every, <laughs> every magazine in the world, you know. What secret powers did these men possess? And um, uh, so I thought, well, that, that was probably a pretty corny thing. But if my brother was interested in it, and he, he said they're sort of like mystic Freemasons, only they had women. Right. And, and um, so uh, the, I guess the women, the woman thing. <laughs> You know, so, oh boy, mystical masons with women. And uh, was, um, was that the attractor you think then? <laughs> I, well, I've I've been married my whole life, so it it, it had to have been only a, uh, uh, a vicarious attractor. I see what you mean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> do, do you think, uh, Lon, that? Um, you you wouldn't have gone down this path if it wasn't for your um, experiences with uh, LSD and other psychedelic, uh, psychedelic drugs. I I can probably say yes. Okay, and and I certainly don't want to uh, uh, encourage people to do anything um, you know illegal or foolhardy uh, with their brains. Uh, but I tell you, I I needed a real. Uh, uh, something very dramatic uh, to pull me out of the of the base material. Uh, I was a jerk. Okay, <laughs> I was, uh, it, it took it took something uh, very dramatic. It, it, it took literally a, one of uh, a religious experience par excellence to. Uh, uh, to show me that there is uh, so much more to the human mind and so much more to the universe than uh, just going to the school, getting a job, getting married, getting sick and dying. Right, right. Uh, and, so, and do you think that um, also joining uh, the Rosicrucian order and uh, later on, I guess, then the OTO as well, has that uh, helped to, to, to enhance that and, and propel your spiritual journey in that sense? Yes, it gave me um, it gave me the the discipline, kind of the step by step discipline that uh, that I needed to move to move forward with this uh, this growth process. Um, I I truly have nothing but uh, you know good things to say about uh, uh, the, the the Rosicrucian order, and they they sh first of all they they showed me that I enjoyed ritual work. I enjoy taking these these inner concepts that uh, I, I dealt with inside myself during my years of um, um, working with Eastern mysticism, and it showed me how I can I can project these inward things outside of myself and start dealing with them as if they were objective things. So dealing objectively with subjective. Uh, uh, concepts is sort of what magic uh, magic is, and uh, I, I learned that I, I I enjoyed I resonated I, with ritual. I had I I learned I had a passion for uh, for sacred ceremony. I learned that uh, that I really enjoyed uh, putting on a robe and strutting around in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And, um, and not only that, but the, so the it, it, is, is that what it is? Uh, the, the rituals, <laughs> if you mean, if you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that what it's implying here, or is it more, obviously? I understand that there's more beyond this, you know. No, the, of course there's more beyond yeah. that, but yeah. it it uh, gave me the feeling that I could enter into uh, a sacred environment uh, that was outside of myself as as uh, uh, well, as inside of myself, I sort of put two and two together that there is no outside of your, your yourself, and uh, and that things that you do seemingly on the outside, you're doing on the inside too. And it's uh, it's one of those, uh, I guess, cabalistic illuminations that uh, uh, you know people 
people shoot for, but I found out that I resonated very well with that. Not only that, but the, the, the degree structure, the initiatory degree structure that um, my AMORC experience uh, uh, introduced me to uh, would later come in very, very handy when I, when I started to see um, and study the, uh, the degree ritual degree work of the initiatory societies such as the, the Golden Dawn or um, uh, Crowley's OTO mm -hmm. or AA. And um, so it was a wonderful, wonderful training ground for me. Uh, eventually, uh, naturally, because I, I was a young man and impatient and brash and irreverent, um, that uh, eventually I sensed that the Amorc pace was pretty uh, was going to be pretty slow, and uh, I started to to poke around for with other things, and I, I I took this marvelous correspondence course by an organization called Builders of the Aditum, mm -hmm. or the B O T A, and they had a they had a, a like a Kabbalah tarot correspondence course, and I I'd never uh, been uh, exposed to the tarot, and I didn't know what it had to do with the Kabbalah. And uh, uh, for about three years, I, I, I took their marvelous correspondence course, and I learned uh, a great deal about the, the tarot from a Kabbalistic uh, point of view. And so it was like my, my boot camp, my training ground for uh, Hermetic Kabbalah. Mm. And... Um, what would that, you say? Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say the uh, my passion for the Kabbalah, my passion for the tarot cards, um, and my uh, involvement in, in the Rosicrucians um, all sort of dovetailed together one afternoon when I was uh, at the South Coast Plaza Shopping Center here in Costa Mesa, and I ran across uh, a deck of tarot cards in a beautiful box. And uh, uh, the back of the box had a beautiful drawing of the, the rose cross, the hermetic rose cross on the back. And he, I said to myself, this is, gee, I'm into the Rosicrucians. I like that. I'm into tarot cards. I like that. Tarot cards are into Kabbalah. I like that. And I, uh, the, the name of this tarot deck was the, the Thoth Tarot, or T-H-O-T-H however you want to pronounce that. Right. And uh, I, even though I didn't have, you know, much money, I bought that deck and I took it home and I opened it up and I was freaked out. The First of all, the cards are indescribably beautiful. But at the same time, they're really weird. And they, they weren't like any tarot deck that I'd ever seen before. And they were kind of scary. And the colors were very disturbing in, in some of them. And the images were very disturbing. Not because they, were, they looked particularly evil or anything, but they, they were so breathtakingly strange mm. that it, it was disturbing to me. And uh, I, I looked at that fool card, the very first one in that deck, and the and this guy looks truly crazy, and he's got horns, and and he's got doesn't look like he's got eyelids, and and there's strange web-like um, perspective um, threads that uh, uh, dominate the background, so you don't know whether you're being pulled in visually to the cards or whether the cards are, are projecting out at you. Uh, they require your mind to uh, uh, go to dimensional places that your mind usually doesn't go to mm. when you uh, look at tarot cards. So I was disturbed a bit, and I thought, you know, these cards are so beautiful that I think... Um, uh, they're so they're be so beautiful and captivating that it was almost like the devil drew them. Hmm. But this um, is uh, the, the the 
thought Terodek, that's uh, the one by uh, Crowley, isn't that right? That's the, that's the one by Crowley and, and Frida Harris. Yes. But I, I did, I'd never heard of Crowley before. I never heard of any of this. But um, the only thing I can compare it to is um, uh, in the 1800s, there was this, this marvelous uh, violinist, uh, Paganini. Okay, Paganini could play the violin better than anybody in the planet. He could make the violin sound like no one had ever made the violin sound before. And his his contemporaries and uh, and other musicians who were jealous of this this immense talent um, uh, said, "No human can play that beautifully. He has to have help from the devil." <laughs> right. And uh, and so he overheard that one day and he thought, oh, I'm going to have some fun. And and so he started showing up to his concerts being delivered in a hearse and he'd, he'd wear a wild black cape. And he, he really uh, had fun with that um, that superstitious thing. Well, when I looked at that South tarot deck, it was almost like this is this is too magically beautiful. The the. And in my youth, in my superstitious youth, um, I, you know, I, I had that idea in the back of my mind. Maybe this is just so beautiful that only only strange supernatural forces um, could have went into its creation. Hmm. And then I looked at the side of the box, and it said Aleister Crowley, uh, created by Aleister Crowley. And the name sort of rang a bell, but I didn't know what it was. And I had a little occult dictionary uh, that I had bought at the supermarket about a month earlier, really at the at the grocery store at, near the checkout. They had like make your own sushi and and how to play bridge and occult dictionary. <laughs> and, and it's just like a it's just like a pamphlet, you right. know. And I right. I uh, I got that out, and sure enough, I found the name Alistair Crowley. In it, and it said, Alistair Crowley, famous Scottish Satanist. Hmm. And I went, Oh boy, oh man, you know, I was right. The devil made these, <laughs> the devil created these cards. And um, I, uh, so I had a little, little crisis. I had a little freak out. I had a little nervous breakdown. And I put those cards back in the box. And, um, the next time I talked to my brother, my brother says, oh, I, I bought a book, uh, you know, a couple years ago that I think is the book that goes with those cards. He says, I'm not afraid of the cards. Give me the cards so they'll go with that book. Hmm. And so I, I gave my brother those cards and I said, good riddance. And um, uh, a week or so later, a good friend of ours who I, I write about in my uh, autobiography, uh, my life with the spirits. Um, it's it's a magical friend. It's a friend that pops up in your life about every three years and changes everything. Hmm. Uh, and a, a, um, a physical friend, or are we talking about a spiritual yes, friend? Okay. Yes, yeah. a, a physical friend, but but physical friends are angels and spirits too, you know, hmm. um, in their own way. But anyway, Mad Bob had been in Guatemala growing mushrooms or um, some, something exciting and un illegal. And um, we hadn't seen him in about three years. And we hugged and we said, what, what have you been up to? And, and I said, well, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the Kabbalah and, uh, and tarot and uh, initiatory societies and stuff. And, and I really uh, am having a good time with my magical career here. Uh, and then in passing, I said, oh, by the way, I, I really dodged a bullet there. I, I uh, had this uh, tarot deck by this Satanist guy, and I almost got sucked into using it. And, uh, and Bob said, uh, you know, what Satanist guy? And I said, well, Aleister Crowley. And then Bob looked at me like I was the, the stupidest person in the world. And uh, I knew he was thinking that because he said, you're the stupidest person in the world. <laughs> and uh, he said, everything that you think you want to learn about this Kabbalah and about this hermetics and about this mysticism and this magic and this Western tradition, 
everything you want to know and want to learn, this guy knew more than anyone on the planet. Hmm. And I and I said, well, but it says he was a Satanist, you know, was he <laughs> was he a Satanist? And and um, Bob says, uh, no, he wasn't a Satanist. And then he then he thought for a second, and then he says, "Well, yeah, he sort of was." <laughs> right. <laughs> and then he and then he then he then he changed his mind again. He said, "But no, 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 he's not a Satanist." And and finally he said, "Look, if he was a Satanist, he was a good kind of Satanist, and you are just going to love this guy." And um, so I said, "Okay," and, he, and Bob made me promise that I'd get those cards back and that I would borrow my brother's book, which is called the book of Thoth. Uh, one of the last things Crowley wrote in his life. And, uh, in that book, Crowley does indeed try to explain everything he's learned and experienced in, in magic in the 72 odd years of his life. And that was sort of my introduction, uh, to Aleister Crowley, and, and it was several years, uh, it took me several years to um, uh, completely feel comfortable with the fact that the man really led a very eccentric and, and wild and crazy life, mm -hmm. but, but he was brilliant beyond, um, uh, he truly had no peer uh, as far as uh, a modern, uh, you know, 20th century um, magical mind was concerned, and that's what that's what got me on the on the path to uh, a formal um, a formal study of Crowley's works. Mm. Um, so, in in your studies, you've been studying Crowley now for for a long time, and 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 again, this is a question that many people again come up against as soon as they pop you know come up against his work, so to speak, uh, and and there's different sources as there always are to you know that this is the most evil man that ever existed. Some say he's the most inf influential uh, uh, a person of the of the 20th century and so forth. But um, do do you feel that the that the man Alistair Crowley still is either black and white like this, or is he more a shade of gray? Have you been able to define him more, so to speak? Oh, oh, he's well. I would say he's a very brilliant shade of gray. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, first of all, I, I don't want to to excuse or uh, apologize the man's shortcomings. Um, he certainly did have shortcomings. He was a human being. He was uh, um, uh, he, he had as many flaws and um, shortcomings as uh, you or me or or anybody else. Uh, but you can still be a very human, very flawed individual as far as relationships with other people or, or uh, peculiarities of, of, uh, of character and relationships and such and still be a bona fide holy man. Mm. Uh, uh, one of the I, – I, I like to uh, use the example of uh, Sri Ramakrishna – uh, for people who are familiar with uh, the great Eastern yogi, holy man, guru, he was the guru of uh, Swami Vivekananda and uh, more or less the, the, the heart and soul and, and uh, creator of uh, what in America we call the Vedanta Society, which is, uh, you know, formal Hinduism. Right. And... Um, uh, you read of stories of Vivek or of uh, uh, Rama, Ramakrishna, and he was not your stereotypical uh, guru. He would uh, uh, he would buy drugs for his disciples. <laughs> he would <laughs> he would uh, flaunt eating meat. Uh, he he had uh, relationships with with women. He he did things which may not seem to our 21st century sensitivities very, very wild and crazy, but for the the image of a of a, of a standard guru in uh, in India, 
the guy was a was a wild loose cannon. Hmm. Well, Crowley was this, uh, was similar to that. Only Crowley had um, Crowley's brilliance even would blind himself. He was so brilliant uh, intellectually that he could not fathom that everyone else wasn't almost as brilliant as he was. It, it, it did not occur to him that people could not tell when he was joking or when he was being facetious mm -hmm. or, or if he was or if he was being outrageous uh, for the sake of of shocking people out of their spiritual complacency. And he he figured everybody was catching on to, to what he was doing. And the fact is that hardly anybody was catching on to what he was doing. Um, a good example is um, people accuse him of being a cannibal. Mm. Even today, people mm. say, well, Alison Crowley ate people. Right. And... Um, uh, well, first of all, I'll start off by saying, no, he didn't eat people. <laughs> um, uh, he was on a mountain climbing expedition. Uh, you know, he's a world-class mountaineer. Some of his records still hold right. today. Right. And uh, he was on a mountain climbing expedition. And when they were organizing the climb and organizing the party, uh, they're in the foothills of wherever it was, Nepal, um, they were forced, uh, the, the only porters that, that they could, um, that were available for them to hire Sherpas, I guess we could call them Sherpas, but that they're porters, mm -hmm. uh, were a team of men who the year before had mutinied, um, uh, against, um, they'd been hired by, I believe it was a German party of climbers. And about halfway up, when the going got tough, these guys murdered and and uh, left to die their their German uh, the German party. Hmm. Okay, these guys were. Would you want to hire these guys to, you know, to to climb, you know, with you? No. Um, <laughs> But they were the only people available, and you know, people people plan and save money and uh, um, uh, prepare for sometimes years for these these climbs. And uh, you know, if the weather's bad, they, they go and do it. And, and if uh, the, the only Sherpas you can hire are the people that killed <laughs> killed their bosses last year, you gotta hire them. So they, they hired this this roughneck crew of uh, porters, and Crowley figured that he could keep them in line. And uh, they they uh, run into difficulty, weather difficulty, and um, and everybody is grumbling, and they want to go back back home. They they're all thinking it's too dangerous to go forward. And as sort of a diversionary tactic, Crowley. Um, uh, takes two of them and scouts out ahead for the next day's climb. And there's this classic um, image of these ice bridges, you know, that uh, that uh, span these hideous chasms and abysses, right. you know. Yes. A and um, as it turned out, uh, the two men that he took uh, uh, did not follow his instructions and uh, concerning one of these ice bridges, and uh, they fell to their death. Now Crowley had, um, had was in a predicament where he would have to go back to camp with all these other guys that that were already experienced in killing their bosses. Mm and go back and tell them that um, it was so dangerous up ahead that two of them already were killed. He, it was an almost impossible uh, situation. Crowley had to go back and tell these guys 
uh, information that would make them mutiny and kill. Okay, it was it was horrible. Mm -hmm. And Crowley, in his perverse wit, went back and didn't mention the fact that the other two were missing. And when the when the rest of the the Sherpas uh, questioned him about where these other two were, Crowley said, "I killed them and ate them." Hmm. And it and it was such a weird thing to say. And oh, I think he probably pulled a revolver on them, <laughs> you know, hmm. as he said that. But they were so freaked. And there's in their superstitious mind, they they looked on Crowley as a as some kind of a wild wild demon, and uh, the the party returned home safely, okay, and they didn't mutiny. Word got out that Crowley had confessed to killing and eating two Sherpas. Right. When he gets back to India, um, and uh, he's, they're interviewed by members of the Alpine Club, which were very kind of jealous of Crowley's uh, independent party's climb. Uh, reporters ask him, is it, is it true, Mr. Crowley, that you killed and ate two of your Sherpas? Now, in Crowley's mind, no one in the world would believe that he killed and ate two Sherpas. So just for fun, just facetiously, he said, oh, of course I did. Right. And I guess everybody, everybody there giggled, or most of the people giggled and knew what was was going on. But by the time that reached the newspapers, mm -hmm. Alistair Crowley killed and ate two Sherpas, and uh, he enjoyed that absurdity so much that that he continued to, when people ask him, he can he continued to laugh at them and say, "Oh, of course, what mm -hmm. would you have done?" kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just kind of one example of uh, uh, how Crowley is underestimating um, the public at large uh, uh, with his wit. Of course, he didn't kill those guys and ate them, and he felt bad about it. And he, he writes about the, the incident in his confessions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and another, um, uh, another more uh, exotic uh, rumor was that um, that he wrote in black and white um, in Magic and Theory and Practice in a chapter called The Bloody Sacrifice. Um, he uh, uh, talks about this uh, a sacrifice of a male child. Right. And um, he's in a footnote. He said. Uh, that uh, his records show that he'd done that 120 times last year or <laughs> one year he did that. And uh, of course, he's got other footnotes that says, you know, that when an adept says one thing, he's, uh, he's probably uh, saying another. And in another footnote in that same chapter, uh, he all but says in so many words, please don't take what I'm saying literally. Here. Right, right. Hmm. Uh, okay, so what he's talking about in this bloody sacrifice uh, chapter is he's talking about sex magic. And in 1923 or four, when, when uh, this chapter was written, uh, it was not, uh, not only not proper, it was not legal uh, to talk about certain explicit sex acts. Uh, even, even people in medical journals had to be careful about how they, they breached that topic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so what Crowley was, was saying, and he thought it was clear to absolutely everybody that, that knew where he was going with this line of, uh, of uh, discussion, what he was saying was that in that given year, his records show that he um, he ejaculated 120 times without making a woman pregnant. Mm, see, okay. what you, see what you mean? Yes. And um, and so he was doing it in such a way as to as to offer very advanced 
uh, magical, sexual magical techniques in theory, uh, but, but doing it in a way that uh, people intelligent enough to uh, uh, be interested in that subject in the first place would know exactly what he was saying. Hmm. And not only that, in such a way as they'd get, uh, he'd get a smile out of them, you know. Uh, but I tell you, when he wrote that, not everybody was laughing. And um, today, I, they still quote that as proof that he confessed to doing that. Yes. Uh, the the truth is, Crowley never did anything. Was never arrested um, uh, for 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 any crime. Uh, other than those involved in in bankruptcy, well, that, that, that's quite a quite a quite a way to to veil uh, that type of terminology. It, it's it's to uh, bring it up another notch, so to speak. <laughs> to be to be, yes. you know, it's. Uh, but do you think that Crowley, like in one sense, didn't uh, ultimately didn't care about what anyone else thought about this or what he was doing? I mean, he was doing his own thing in that regard, and and it just didn't really care. About right. what other, how other people would interpret this? Do you think that that was the case as well? I th- yeah, I think Crowley in his first 50 years didn't care what what people thought. As a matter of fact, let them think what they want. Right. But I I, I think as he as he matured and in the last 20 years of his life, when when he realized that uh, his work had really been. Uh, 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 damaged by this cavalier uh, attitude, and that 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 people weren't reading his books. He 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 wasn't having uh, you know the ability to attract uh, uh, disciples. And so I, I think, especially in the last ten or fifteen years, uh, he truly regretted. Um, all of those, uh, uh, I guess, indiscretions of of uh, attitude, hmm. and uh, he, I think he would have just loved to uh, to have been a- accepted in the in the in the world of um, uh, spiritual exploration uh, in the same way as like Aldous Huxley or right. um, uh, be, because he was of that caliber, and and so it was sad. It was sad in a way, uh, and and we still enjoy the the outrageousness of his of his behavior, um, uh, in the early years. But as it turned out for Crowley personally, it was it was a bit uh, tragic. Hmm. Uh- I want to go back a little bit to Crowley's uh, tarot deck as well and and ask if you've been able to kind of, uh, I guess, in one way, figure out why you were so drawn in by this deck or or what it was about the particular composition of these cards that kind of uh, uh, triggered, if you will, this feeling in you when you looked at them. Um, Oh, yeah. It's a fascinating subject. Um, I took three years uh, and wrote... um, I guess is back in 2005 uh, when I finished. I wrote a book called Understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot, and um, it's a it's a pretty thick book. And it, uh, I don't know if I or anyone else in the planet. No, it was back in 2003. He was finished. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I certainly, I I was more or less. Um, uh, recruited by um, uh, members of uh, or, or people at New Leaf Distributing and uh, and Wiser Books uh, to write a, an extended um, commentary explanation that that, that might be um, suitable for people <laughs> to try to figure out what Crowley was saying in the in the Book of Thoth and with his Thoth Tarot. Hmm. Um, and so, but I, I went ahead and with the project, and it took me three years. Um, so it's called Understanding Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot, and it's uh, it's it's been translated into German. Um, I think that's the only language it's uh, been translated in so far, and where I try to ex- try to explain this. Um, 
Uh, Frida Harris uh, was, uh, Crowley met Frida Harris very late in, late in life. He was in his late 60s and she was in her early 60s. And she was an avant-garde artist. And she was a disciple of disciples of Rudolf Steiner. Right. And she was also a theosophist and um, uh, a, a co-mason. Um, so she was interested in, in everything Aleister Crowley was interested in. The, the Golden Dawn had long, long before um, dissolved. So she was, uh, uh, and she met Crowley in the uh, 36, I believe, 36, 38. Um, and they met at a party with other uh, eccentric people. <laughs> and uh, Harris, um, of course, knew Crowley by reputation. And Crowley uh, and Harris was uh, smart enough to not be afraid of him. And um, uh, Harris more or less approached Crowley and said in so many words, look, you're, uh, um, you're approaching your 70s here and, and uh, your health is not all that good. You're, you're going to die pretty soon. I think you should write a book that, uh, that synthesizes uh, all of your accumulated knowledge and experience in the magical arts. And I think you ought to organize that book uh, along the lines of the tarot, Kabbalistically. And Crowley said, no, that that's not a, that's too much work. <laughs> right, right. He, he didn't want to do that at this stage of his life because it's just too much work. And, uh, but he counter offered uh, Harris uh, that she could, um, uh, just touch up and redo uh, a, a more standard, like gypsy fortune telling tarot deck, and just tweak it a little bit, and that he could write the, the kind of like the little white book that comes with every deck of tarot cards, and that they could split the money. And at the time, Crowley was an undischarged uh, bankrupt, so he he didn't even have. Uh, uh, control over his own assets, so he had to ha had to think up these little projects, you know, to make money under the table. Hmm. And um, oh, they went back and forth and back and forth, and and Harris finally came back with an offer that she would uh, join his uh, AA and his OTO, and that she would uh, uh, formally become his magical student, and that she would she would uh, pay him a weekly, uh, a weekly figure to teach her magic. And in the meantime, he would write that book and she would illustrate that book with 78 full color watercolor paintings. Mm. And Crowley, that was an offer Crowley <laughs> couldn't refuse. And they started the project and uh, they thought that it would be through in, in six months. And of course, it took uh, what, six years. Mm, and, uh, and they had to do it all through all the inconveniences of World War II okay. and, the, yeah. and the bombings and the blitz and all of that. Yes. But uh, you ask what makes these cards so weird that it makes you feel like you're being pulled into it or or uh, that they're jumping out at you and the, this thing that requires your mind to switch kind of to another dimension uh, is really, uh, she set out uh, consciously to, um, to do that. And she did it through a process that uh, a technique, a graphic technique that uh, uh, was uh, uh, kind of the brainchild of Rudolf Steiner and uh, they called it projective synthetic geometry. Hmm. And uh, if you'll, uh, you know, Google that, you'll see examples of uh, uh, how uh, it's expressed graphically. And it looks like um, uh, uh, webs, webs. If you like take a grid of rubber bands 
and then then stick your fingers in the rubber bands and stretch them out one way or another. Um, that's an example of projective synthetic uh, geometry. Mm. And, um, you know, I don't pretend to understand it. I'm a simple man. And uh, when you when you get that abstract, you kind of you kind of lose me. But one of the explanations of uh, at least theoretically uh, of synthetic projective geometry, you can say it both ways means the same thing, um, is that in regular Euclidean geometry, if you draw a circle and you put a dot in the very center of the circle, that the distance, the radii, uh, when, the, when the point is in the circle, the radii, if it's in the very center, the radii are equal lengths. Yes. And if you move the dot away from the middle, the wall it comes closer to, the line is shorter, and the wall that it moves away from is longer, and the other other uh, radii along the the circumference. arc, right, of the circumference, uh, also uh, change in their relative length. Yes. But in per Projective synthetic geometry, the idea that the point and the circumference can occupy the same positions simultaneously. Hmm. I don't ask me to expl <laughs> explain that, <laughs> but but they but using these lines, using these lines and uh, and grids and manipulating them, just like you see in the background of, uh, uh, say, the High Priestess card in the Thos Tarot, it's a wonderful example, and uh, how if you, you uh, the same grid pattern, if you, if you go to the, the Queen of Cups and you put those two images head to head, they create one, one single magnificent uh, uh, array of, of these uh, these web-like grids, and so the uh, literal she 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 consciously uh, went out of her way to give you an experience that when you look at the at the dimensions and the perspective in the cards, it is different than the perspective and dimensions of of the rest of the room. <laughs> that you're in, right, right? That's around that. Yeah, that's around that card, mm. and and so it does a thing to your brain. And I'm and I'm sure there, uh, someone far more knowledgeable than I could uh, could suggest what it does to your brain. But uh, it is really something very, very special, very, very advanced. And Crowley just loved that kind of stuff, mm. and and thought that that would be the the perfect artistic vehicle. Of um, of uh, visual expression of of his ideas, and and Crowley's Crowley's main um, uh, revelation in in all of his work uh, is this idea that the age has changed. That uh, uh, we we have these uh, uh, he saw them as uh, the dynamics of the age changing as, a, as the interplay, the development of, of uh, uh, well, he calls them for convenience sake, the, the goddess Nuit, mm -hmm. the, the star goddess, uh, the goddess of infinite space, and, uh, and her, her lover, her counterpart, Hadith, uh, uh, who is consistently the point within her very center. Yes. And so, uh, again, using this uh, image of a circle with a point in the middle of it, uh, the one infinity of, of uh, universe, not only of space, but of, of uh, consciousness, uh, could be symbolized by this, this infinitely expanding uh, circle. 
And Nuit, the, the star goddess that has all of the infinite stars within her body, Nuit would be uh, symbolized by that uh, circle. Yes. And, Had, and Hadit would, would be that um, uh, abstract conscious uh, or concept of uh, the dimensionless point. Uh, she's the big it, uh, the big big, and he's the big small, <laughs> and uh, and he's always in the center of her. But she's expanding, okay. Mm-hmm. And so that uh, both infinities are infinitely everywhere. So so the uh, if the if the circumference is infinite, and the 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 point in the center is infinite. They are both infinitely everywhere. Yeah. And on and on one um, way of looking at them, they're making love in, infinitely. And and this is the the great love making process that causes the 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 vibration, if you will, that makes the field of operation for the universe to manifest as. Hmm. And that fe- that vibrating field of manifestation is. Uh, 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 personified as Rahur Kuwait or their their child, hmm. and to have this artistic concept that deals with infinite circumferences and infinite um, centers, to have this projective synthetic geometry being the vehicle, the artistic, technical, hands-on technical uh, vehicle for Crowley to to, to splash. His um, his cosmic principles is just the perfect combination of of art and and spirituality. Mm. Crowley and Crowley and Harris w- were a match made in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Needed a real uh, uh, something very dramatic. Uh, to pull me out of the of the base material, um, I was a jerk. Okay, <laughs> I was, hmm. uh, it, it, it took it took something uh, very dramatic. It, it, it took literally a, one of uh, a religious experience par excellence to uh, uh, to show me that there is. Uh, so much more to the human mind and so much more to the universe than uh, just going to the school, getting a job, getting married, getting sick and dying. Right, right. Uh, and so, and do you think that um, also joining uh, the Rosicrucian order and uh, later on, I guess, then the OTO as well, has that uh, helped to, to, to enhance that and, and propel your spiritual journey in that sense? Yes, it gave me... Um, it gave me the the discipline, kind of the step by step discipline that uh, that I needed to move to move forward with this uh, this growth process. Um, I I truly have nothing but uh, you know good things to say about uh, uh, the, the the Rosicrucian order, and they they sh- first of all they they showed me that I enjoyed ritual work. I enjoy taking these these inner concepts that uh, I, I dealt with inside myself during my years. Of finally, uh, I finally started to get a clue when my uh, my brother uh, joined uh, an organization called um, uh, Rosicrucian Order A M O R C. Right, Amor. And you've seen them advertised in Popular Mechanics <laughs> in every <laughs> every magazine in the world. You know. What secret powers did these men possess? And um, uh, so I thought, well, that, that was probably a pretty corny thing. But if my brother was interested in it, and he, he said they're sort of like mystic Freemasons, only they had women. Right. And, and um, so uh, the, I guess the women, the woman thing. <laughs> You know, so, oh boy, mystical masons with women. And uh, um, was that the attractor you think then? <laughs> I, well, I've I've been married my whole life, so it it, it had to have been only a, uh, uh, a vicarious attractor. I see what you mean? Uh, yeah. 
but uh, <laughs> do, do you think, uh, Lon, that um, you you wouldn't have gone down this path if it wasn't for your um, experiences with uh, LSD and other psychedelic uh, psychedelic drugs? I I can probably say yes. Okay, and and I certainly don't want to. Um, uh, encourage people to do anything, um, you know, illegal or foolhardy uh, with their brains. Uh, but I tell you, I, I need mystical or magical uh, method. Uh, the goal is the same thing, but the but the process is is uh, completely different. So I came to the conclusion that I was trying to play uh, Eastern mysticism software on my Western hardware yes you know and and um it it just wasn't working out and so i i went on a kind of a frustrating quest for a few years to find something in uh that resonated with my with my western psyche uh, the same way that um uh, the eastern psyche uh, resonates with things like the Tao Te Ching and and um uh, the, the, you know the wonderful um, uh, concepts of of Tao, of the Tao. Yes. And uh, um, so I was I was looking for a Western Tao, and uh, for a while I wasn't coming up with very much. Uh, you know, Christian mysticism, um, uh, at least for me, uh, contained. Uh, or brought with it uh, a lot of unfortunate baggage uh, of uh, you know self-loathing and, and <laughs> guilt and, and all of those nasty things. And um, I'm, I'm sure it doesn't have to be that way with everybody, but with my particular background, <clears throat> it did. Mm. So um, uh, it finally... Uh, before we talk more about that and, and some of your books and uh, the OTO and so forth, I'd, I'd like to, if uh, you don't mind, Lon, if you could just share with us a little bit about um, how you first became interested in magic, uh, Alistair Crowley and the Kabbalah and, and even the, the Tarot. It's always interesting to hear how people uh, get involved in these uh, esoteric subjects. Well, I, I guess we could start by saying I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s, uh, a flower child, an aging hippie. Uh, I got interested in um, in human consciousness. I, I guess we could uh, lump everything into that term. Uh, back in the mid 1960s, um, when I uh, came in contact and had uh, uh, several uh, remarkable and um, influential experiences uh, with uh, LSD and uh, psychedelics. And I, up until that time, uh, I was more or less a, uh, a Midwestern materialist, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I didn't have very much interest in uh, in spiritual matters per se as I was uh, growing up. But I always considered myself sort of a spiritual um, uh, explorer. Yes. And part of my exploration, as soon as I graduated from high school and came out to California to go to college, uh, was with uh, the, the psychedelic phenomena. And um, it, uh, it more or less, I don't want to bore you with I saw God on LSD uh, story, <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, it, it more or less told me that uh, uh, human consciousness uh, was a far more wonderful and uh, uh, the fact that learning about myself was going to be the uh, the only uh, endeavor worth pursuing for the rest of my life, and that mm. uh, that that was a springboard uh, into Eastern mysticism, which uh, was you know popular with the Beatles and everything. And, right. Right. Uh, and so I sort of um, uh, dove in to the deep end of the pool of Eastern mysticism and sort of fancied uh, that I would gain enlightenment with a nice shaved head and sitting in a full lotus and, <laughs> and uh, 
but it was sort of strange. I uh, I imagined myself losing my ego and becoming completely enlightened, but I did it in such a way as um, uh, I thought I would look really cool being in <laughs> being in. I would look really cool losing my ego. Right. You know? right. Yeah, and so it, it was. Uh, I sooner or later came uh, face to face with the fact that that um, uh, in a very uh, real way, the 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 Eastern mystical method and the Western 